Good day everyone. Scott from PSP CFB Edmonton here. Today we're gonna to kind of go through a little bit of some cycling endurance, a little bit of a workshop around how to set yourself up a little bit. So a quick tutorial on that. We're gonna talk about proper warm-ups and the timings of those warm-ups. We're also gonna talk about some different styles of training, how we're gonna train, how you put it together into a little bit of a workout. And then of course, talking about cool down and then any other you know facts, questions, things like that. So to begin with, endurance cycling. I've got a setup slightly different than what you might have at home, or maybe you're only using a spin bike within your facility. Either way works, okay? All that's gonna change is the intensity that you're gonna push, and it's gonna be the gearing's gonna be a little bit different. But other than that, don't worry if you don't have a regular road bike, that's completely fine. If you don't have that setup, if you do, great. If you even wanna do this outside riding, it works the same. For teaching purposes, I've got myself set up on a nice little trainer right here. So these are 10 of these is what we have here at the base. Uh, that way I can work with a triathlon team. We can work with other cyclists that do have their own road bikes and want to do some stuff in the winter time. This is a great way to still be able to be on your own bike, be comfortable with the gear that you have and still get a proper training regimen in. And again, if you don't have any of this, do not sweat ride a spin bike, use a stationary bike, it all works the same, it's gonna be based on your intensity, okay? When it comes to actual cycling, we always think Tour de France, we think the pros. Don't worry about them, we're not there yet. We're gonna get there, but not yet. So, goal with this, when it comes to endurance cycling, is again, your effort. It's only gonna boil down to how hard you push and how hard you feel you're pushing, okay? Cycling is probably one of the easiest, most fun things you can do. It's easier on the joints. You're not gonna worry about knees, things like that. If you get pain in knees, we're gonna talk about a little bit of injury prevention and bike setup as well, which is gonna address some of those problems as well. A couple pieces that you might have that will definitely help you, okay? Number one, a good old bike computer. So if you do have a bike computer, that is a bonus. This will be able to tell you your distance, your average speed, cadence, things like that, if you have the pieces that go with it. Um, without being able to move the camera and everything like that, I also have a cadence sensor on my bike. So that actually gives me the RPMs. As I train, I prefer to train in RPMs as I do not have what they call a power meter, which is gonna measure your wattage, which is the actual power output that you're putting into the pedals, okay? If you have that, that's ideal. If you can get that set up, great. We're talking anywhere in upwards of $1,000 for that though. So don't just go out and spend a crap ton of money to get yourself set up on that. You don't necessarily need it. So we're gonna to toss this back in. When it comes to a road bike, maybe you're a real beginner, you don't have shoes yet. That's completely fine if you just have the flat pedals. If you have clips, there's two different options. So I'm gonna talk about both really quick. I've only got one with me right now. These are the standard road shoe. So it gives a huge, nice big triangle here. Okay, so it kind of clips in over top of the pedal. Um, so it's gonna hold you in place. The other one that you do see before is what they call mountain bike pedals, or it almost looks like a little metal spade um, or a club, depending on who you're talking to. That is also gonna fit just fine. That will work for basic riding. When it does come into actual mountain biking, though, it's a little bit more beneficial. This clips in a little bit harder so you can actually grab those pedals and really pull and torque with those feet, okay? Um, so these are gonna work best. These are gonna be what I'm gonna pop on today. Again, cadence sensor is up to you. Power meter is ideal, but again, you do not need. If you're just on a spin bike, just use the straps ideally, just something that gives you a little bit of a pull, okay? So, talking about pedal stroke, seat height, those kind of setups, starting with seat height. Easiest way, most people kind of do the whole leg bend at 90 degrees. You're kind of at that hip level, it lines up nice, right? Everyone's gonna have an ever so slight difference. I'm just gonna get these on here. When it comes to style of shoe, that's up to you. I have a clip as well as Velcro. Some people like all clips. Some people have the fancy little turn um, that have the metal cables that kind of wrap on. Some like running shoes, Solomon's, things like that. Okay, so I'm just gonna clip in here. First things first, before you do anything, set it to a rough height that you feel that you can at least get onto it and not have to fight with it, and just start to pedal. Does it feel like you're rocking the hips? So you really gotta drop that hip to reach down. Do you feel like you're kissing your knees the whole time? We're bent way too up, okay? Just as an easy number one check. Going a little bit more into depth, you're gonna actually take one foot out, you're gonna place the heel onto your pedal, 
don't care if it's a spin bike pedal, these type of pedals, it doesn't matter. You're gonna put it down to the bottom. Can you reach the bottom without feeling like your hips are tipping you down there? Okay, so what I mean by that is if you pedal a couple times like that, you shouldn't have to feel like your hip has to drop in order to get to the bottom. Okay, so for myself, easy engagement so we can see it. The other way that you can tell is put your foot back in, however it is, with your foot at the bottom and your foot level, if not maybe 10 degrees pointed down, ever so slight, but never point your toes, your calves are gonna kill you, you're not gonna like it. So with a flat foot, you can kind of see it's a bit of an off angle. I've got about 22 degrees, 23 degrees of bend in my knee. You're sitting anywhere between like 20 to 30. Some people ideally say 25 is their number. Some people are very, I want 27. It's gonna be what's comfortable for you. Maybe you go out on your first ride and your knees start to bug you, you're gonna change that seat height so that you can kick away that knee pain, okay? So that's gonna change a little bit. Other options are changing your seat forwards and backwards. That'll be a different video. Same thing with handlebars, that gets really into the nitty gritty if you're a road cyclist, okay? Changing headstock, all that kind of fun stuff, we're not going there, okay? So that's the easiest way. Now, whether you're strapped in or not, this is gonna be easier if you're strapped in, so whether with clipless pedals or you have the strap that comes over top of the foot. If you just have a flat pedal and you're not actually gonna have anything over top of the toes, the pull face is gonna be a little bit more challenging and you're gonna feel your quadriceps a little bit more. Not necessarily a bad thing, just know that that's coming, okay? How it works, you're actually gonna think of a pedal stroke from nine o'clock to three o'clock or three o'clock to nine o'clock, however you wanna look at it. Think of it as a full circle, but think of it more as this plane is more of your work than this plane. And what I mean by that is, is as we're cycling, as soon as I get my left foot to that three o'clock position, I'm starting to pull backwards with my hamstrings. I'm gonna pull from three o'clock to nine o'clock. So come around and pull. As that other foot's coming around, I pull. As soon as we get on top, it's a nice push down. And as soon as you get that start of a push, you start to then pull. So it's a push, pull, push, pull, push, pull easy drill to do with this one take your opposite foot out and have just the one leg do all the work you'll find that you can't just push or else you stop you then need to pull as well so push pull push pull push pull a great way to remember this if it's just something that you need to tell yourself or keep coaching in your mind you're gonna think that you have peanut butter on the tip of your shoes and you're trying to wipe that peanut butter off okay so you're trying to wipe it off on the grass that's your pull face Okay, that's the easiest way to remember it. So it's your push and pull. And then the fun part is just trying to get the balance of one leg doing one thing while the other leg's doing the opposite. Okay, that's just a matter of time. Let's talk about warm up a little bit. When it comes into warm up, especially in an endurance ride or in a road cycling specific, or if you're spending a lot of time on the bike. So if you're a person who spends 10 to 20 hours or less on a bike. 10 minutes is a good solid warm up. You can go longer, you can go shorter. I prefer not to go less than 10, but you can depending on the intensity that you're doing that day. So you're gonna judge it based on how hard are you working that day. Is it a recovery ride? Then we don't need a ton of warm up because it's just a nice easy go. Are you sprinting and doing something hard? You might wanna push closer to 15, 20 minutes, okay? If you're someone who does 20 to 30 hours or more, you're gonna do anywhere between 20 to 40 minutes of a warm up. So for myself, I usually do anywhere between 20 and 25. That's kind of my happy place. I don't ride anywhere near. I just find that with my body, it needs a little bit more time to actually get warm and to get into the groove. What I'm looking at when I do my warm up is it's actually my lung capacity that I'm working with. My legs feel good after five or six minutes, but it takes me some time to regulate my breathing and to get that in check. That's why it takes me longer. Maybe that's something that you can pick up fairly quickly, but again, don't shortchange it just because you pick it up like that and it's three minutes in. Give yourself at least a solid 10 minutes, okay? So, depending on how serious you are, depending on the style of training that you're gonna do. Now, there's a bunch of different styles of training. The one that I prefer to follow myself is I like to do what's called polarized training. And what polarized training is, is you're doing both ends of the spectrum, exactly what you would think polarized is, right? One side to the other side. So within my same training week, 
I do anything from a nice, easy, longer endurance ride where it's not a hard intensity, but I'm going for two, three, four, five hours, or I'm doing something that's an hour long, but it's maximal effort sprints for 35 of that hour, okay? You'll notice that the 20 minute, 25 minute window is my warm up, right? So that's where that hour fits in. Then you take five, 10 minutes to cool down, clean up your gear, pack it back up in the car, head home, go on with your day. Maybe you're heading off to the unit to go do some work. So anywhere in between those, but it's, it's really advantageous and a lot of research has backed it that showing both of those is a beautiful way to do this, okay? Especially if you don't have a lot of time, you wanna work on a couple different options and build those up at the same time. Now, are they gonna advance the same as if you push it all in one modality at the same time? Not quite as much, but when it comes to cycling, it's never that consistent. You're always getting a random hill, someone's chasing you, now you're on a flat, now you're sprinting. Now you're slowing down because you're ahead, you need a little bit of a breather, maybe you're lagging behind and you're just trying to catch your breath. Something as simple as just reaching down and grabbing your water bottle it takes a lot of skill, so you'll probably even slow down doing that, which is then gonna conserve energy. Then you're like, oh no, I'm slowing down. I need to speed up. So then you start to ramp it up again. So it kind of goes up and down in any spectrum. So polarized training is fantastic for that because then you can actually flow with that, okay? So a couple different ways that you can do these. There's anything from what they call an endurance ride. So we'll start there. That's your long, slow distance. That's you're working at like half capacity. You're riding anywhere between two and six hours, depending on what you're doing, right? So it's just a nice, easy ride. You might be in a bigger gear, but it's just a nice, consistent, maybe sitting at around 70 RPM to 80 RPM. Depends on you. I like to ride closer to 90 RPM, sometimes even 95 RPM and that's just because I have a spin background. Is that detrimental? Depending on who you talk to, when you do some research with triathletes, they do like to stay a little bit lower to conserve their leg energy for their run. For myself, never done a triathlon before, I'm super interested in them, but I'm super intrigued with long distance cycling. So, for myself, you ride in a higher gear, I still ride at 90 RPM because I know I'm not getting off the bike unless I'm finished, okay? So, if I knew I had to transition into a run, bringing it down is definitely advantageous. That's one way of doing it. There's another one that can be used as a training skill as well as a warm up. And I'll go back to our warm up and skills once I get through this list. It's what they call high spin. So, in your training session, you're going to drop into what they call your small ring or your lower gears. You might even want to do this in like second or third, okay? Mine's a 22 speed. You can bump it down into like two, three, maybe even four. You're not working on how far you can go. You're working on a good RPM pickup. And what that's gonna do is as you get into the higher, heavier gears, it's gonna work on your overall turnover, okay? As you get the turnover going, means you move faster, means you gear up until you get into that max gear and you're pushing hard. How it's achieved is you're gonna aim at a start 100 RPMs. Now for most that doesn't feel like a lot, but the goal is just to feel fluid, okay? You're gonna work anywhere up to 100 to 140 RPM, okay? So you're pedaling pretty quick. If you don't have, say you've got your own road bike and you don't have a bike computer or you don't have a cadence sensor that gives you that, all you're working on is almost as fast as you can, say 90% of as fast as you can pedal, but keep it smooth. Don't bounce, don't hop don't have that stall at the bottom. That's where your bounce is coming from is we're not fluid. So you gotta take the weight off the pedals slightly and find the balance between weight on the pedals, weight on your handlebars, and weight on the seat. We tend to forget that. Going back really quick, one other piece that we definitely do wanna have, especially if you're doing any kind of endurance cycling, get yourself a good pair of bike shorts. Now I get asked a lot, what's considered a good pair? Well, number one, it's gonna be your budget because these can fluctuate anywhere from like $40 to $600 or more. So it just depends on what you're looking for. When it comes to cycling shorts, what I found is these are one of the few items out there where the more you spend, the better you're getting, okay? And what's changing in it is it's not so much the color or the style, which might change, which is fine, that's personal preference, but it's the chamois that you're sitting on. It's the actual padded portion, so you're trying to make sure that it fits your butt correctly. It's matching your bike seat so you're not hanging off on one spot and then it's gonna vary in thicknesses and material made, okay? So you have the options of what works for yourself. You can go cheap as an entry level. As you start getting up in distance, 
I recommend going with something a little bit more expensive. So if you can save up and get something a little bit fancier off the start, that's even better. But if you can't, don't fear it. Um, just know that at times you might think, oh, it's not a great product because it's not working as well as I thought it would. Sometimes it is just the price, but it's something is still better than nothing. Worst case, I've even seen people take a small pillow or tuck a towel in, something like that. For me, that throws off my seat, that throws off my piddling. You know, I start to teeter, I start to rock, I start to slide, and then you get the good old um, saddle sores and things like that, which is the last thing you want when you're cycling. Today, I'm not in my bike shorts, obviously, for I don't have any black, and that's what we gotta wear here at CFB Edmonton. So, I'm wearing this guy. So, going back really quick, sorry, I've kind of rambled. You got our high spin, so 100 to 140 RPM. So what you're gonna do is you're gonna hit somewhere between 30 seconds, give or take, maybe even 20 second little intervals. And what it's gonna look like, you're gonna get yourself up, we're gonna drop into our small ring first. So you really wanna drop it down. It's really light. I'm gonna show you what not to do first. So people will get up to their speed and you can see the bounce on me, right? So you can see kind of how I hop. I'm hitting the bottom and my body's just not coordinated enough to think to come around. Reason that it's happening is I'm loading too much into my feet and I'm taking my weight off my butt. Okay, so I'm not on my saddle anymore. So you almost wanna put a little bit of weight into the hands, really relax into the seat. And then as you pedal, the bounce goes away. Okay, I still have a little bit of it because it's something I'm still working on, but you'll notice that this is a whole lot less than this. Okay, that's a great way to work on turnover. Then as you get up into the higher gears and you have some weight, it's naturally gonna feel easier because you're gonna lose the bounce because you're gonna have some actual weight behind you, right? Going down into hills, hills are another great one. If you can't mimic hills, you can't find hills, wherever you are, it's flat. Around Edmonton, it's actually quite tough to find some of these hills. You have to travel a little bit into the city, so you're packing your bike up, things like that. A lot of people, when they cycle, they like to do it from a central point and a nice easy point, as well as most endurance cyclists like to try and find the flat with maybe some nice rolling hills, but no any big steep hill climbs. How you're gonna mimic it is you're gonna go into a nice heavy gear. What that gear is, that's up to you. I always jump into my big ring, So we're fiddling in, we bounce up into that big ring, we drop into a couple more heavy guys. Being on this guy, I've got a nice little machine here and a little lever that will actually add resistance to my rear wheel. So that's exactly what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna start to throw more weight on. It's gonna be nice and heavy, and I'm basically gonna work at 50 to 60 RPM. And I'm gonna ride this. And it's gonna be anywhere between two and five minutes that you can do this. So it's a nice big hard long climb. You also have the point if you want, you can do this standing so we can get into it as well. Remember, try and keep it fluid. Try not to have the jerk and the jolt. Try and keep it fluid is always good. On a bike trainer, you sometimes get a little bit of slippage so it's gonna feel like it's inconsistent and that's okay. It's never gonna mimic 100% outside and that's okay too. It's just a matter that you're on your bike, you're on your own gear. So super slow, so 50 is somewhere here. So you want it heavy enough that you can start to hear, I'm getting that slight labored breathing, but it's not crazy hard. It's probably 70% of maximal effort, maybe even 80% of maximal effort. Should feel the legs more than the lungs. Here's a great time to work on that push and pull, right? So from that three o'clock to nine o'clock, that nice big pull, fire those hamstrings, balance out. Okay, that's a great one. Super, super good to do. Reason for it is when you get to any kind of slight up, you naturally slow down. So this way you can still keep your cadence, maybe even bump it up five RPMs while you're going up that small hill. And that's still gonna keep you at the same pace. You're not gonna bog down and feel like you're slowing and slowing and slowing and slowing. And then by the top, you're sucking wind, just barely reaching over that crest, okay? Getting into tempos or what they call intervals. These can be done in a variety of different ways. When it comes into the tempos and the intervals, now we're gonna look at anywhere between 30 seconds to five minutes. These ones are gonna be very dependent on you again. This one's gonna be very mentally challenging as well. The reason I say that is you're working at about 90% of maximal effort 
And once you're getting up into those higher levels, five minutes at 90% is gross. It is very challenging, especially if you're riding by yourself or if you're at home, a spin bike's a little bit easier as long as you have someone with you and same with road cycling. If you're actually on the road and someone's pushing you and challenging you, that's good healthy competition. That's gonna keep you going. That's gonna better both of you, okay? Or the whole group, not even. Whoever's there, it's gonna benefit if you're doing all the same thing. So push that. Start small, start 30 seconds, put it fairly heavy and it's, think of you see the finish line, you're about three, 400 yards away and you're just sprinting for it. You're just going. Everything you got, stand up if you need, but just go. Push, 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 push. The key to this one, 30 seconds means you don't start slowing down at 28 and transition at 30. That means you run through 30 and then you start to slow down. As an example of that, when you're running, you'll see the majority of people, if you watch some races, they slow down about five feet before the finish line. They're already starting to descend and slow themselves before they even cross the finish line. If you're going for time, you want to run right through that finish line, then start to slow yourself down. Let's relate it to work. You do your force test. You do your 20 meter rushes. How many of you, and be honest with yourself, me included, I know I do it, on your very last run through, when you're running through before we push that iPad and say stop, you slowed down before that finish line, didn't you? Think back, just take yourself a second and think back. I'm not berating you for it, I just want you to realize that maybe you were doing it and you didn't even notice. So if you kind of go back and go, yeah, I think I did, right? That's all lost time. Same thing with this one, when it's 30 seconds, it's meaning 30 seconds of go, not 28 and then transition at 30, okay? If you're pushing through two minutes, three minutes, four minutes, five minutes, it's just that much more of a mental game because you're gonna wanna slow down. 30 seconds, we can do all out, all the time. No problems, we're gonna feel gassed at the end, we're gonna feel a little gross, but we know that we're good. When we know that that timing is a kilometer away, then our brain starts to go, oh man, and you start to get the self-doubt, you start to get the mind games, your brain starts going, this is too hard, let's slow down, whatever it might be. So in a way, Endurance cycling is great for our mental fortitude. It helps with that mental training. Anyone within the military getting more of that actual mental training and things like that, you have the leg up. The majority of people shut down quick. You've been taught how to work through that and work with it. So you can start to persevere, right? So it's just a matter of building that up. It doesn't matter who you are and who sees this video, okay? Last one is your sprints, which is your all outs. You're doing anywhere between 10 and maybe 30 seconds. Ideally, I like to do between 10 and 20 seconds, okay? And what I mean by that is go. So when you're going, go, all right? The biggest thing here is it needs to be 110% effort. If you think of a Tabata that's 20 seconds on, 10 seconds off, that's exactly what we want, but we want that 20 seconds to be the hardest you've ever pushed in your life. Okay, same thing with these sprints. They're short and we know they're short, so we keep having that positive energy of we can do this. Okay, now five, six, seven, eight intervals in, you might have a different feeling of that, but that's just part of that mental fortitude, that mental fight to get better, to strive to do well, right? What's gonna set you apart from the rest of the people racing or riding, right? So you're leading by example. So those are kind of our mains that we can hit on, okay? So any of those five work great and they can be done in any combination. So I normally ride three to four days a week, depends on the week, I try and get five, um, just with busy schedules it is challenging. So one day of the week I do a long ride, which is usually my Sunday morning rides. You'll hear most runners say that they have a long run day and they kind of keep it the same day. Same with cycling, ideally if you can keep them the same, your body's gonna adapt and know and then you can start to plan your nutrition around, it's a longer day, I need to get some carbs in the night before, I need to load up, I need to get ready, okay? Or if you know it's a shorter sprint day, you know that you can fit it into a tighter time frame. so maybe you have a busy day that day, but you'll still be able to squeeze it in, and it's cutting out the excuses. So I'll do an endurance day. I try and ride in upwards of three hours. Um, that's just me. Again, it's gonna be dependent on your time. It's gonna be dependent on what your schedule looks like, okay? Maybe you can't get away, you have a dog, you have kids, things like that. When you can hand them off, you do what you can. All you're gonna do is you're gonna change your intensities just that little bit, depending on what you need to. 
So with that endurance ride, I'm not just riding, okay? You can do just that ride that I talked about at the beginning. Just put the headphones on, go. Ideally, don't use headphones. I do see a lot of people with it. If you're on super, super quiet roads, that's all right. If you do use headphones, I always recommend using only one ear because I wanna make sure that I can hear, or in this case, if you're using them, you can hear traffic coming, horns, sirens, and so on and so forth. That is super important. As you are a cyclist and you're actually a motor vehicle at that point, you gotta be aware of the rules of the road and you wanna be able to be aware of your surroundings as well. So I do my endurance ride, but I'm gonna add in, like I talked about in the warm up, the high speed. So I'm gonna do 10 or 12 of those within my three hour ride. No specific time of doing them, but if you need something to give you structure and routine, every 10 minutes, do one, 30 seconds. Boom, continue back to your normal ride. 10 more minutes passes, do another one. Speed it up, okay? 100 RPM, first week try 100. If it felt good and you felt like you could get the, the actual turnover, try 105 the following week until you work your way up to 140. If you hit 110 and now you feel bouncy, work around the 105 to 110 until you can hone that in, bang on, then move on to the next, go to 115 or even maybe even only 112. Again, if you don't have this setup, just get a feel for it. Know what you're feeling. If you're on a spin bike, it'll give you the RPMs. The only way you're not gonna know is if you don't have a bike computer and a cadence sensor and you're outside. All I want you to do is basically drop it into a low gear, pedal really quick for 10 to 20 seconds, and then go back to your normal routine. Okay, don't worry about numbers. I'll also add in a good hill day. Ideally, I try and find somewhere that I can repeat on that hill so I get to the top, I coast down, I take a couple minutes break or a nice easy ride. I try not to just stop and then repeat that hill. Get up to the top, back down. I do anywhere up to 15 of them, depending on the day and depending on how long that actual hill is, okay? What's a number for hill? Whatever you can find. Everywhere is gonna be different. Maybe you only have something that's 200 meters long. Maybe you have something that's a kilometer long. The longer the better, because then it really gives you a good chance to pump through it, work on changing gears, being efficient with that, knowing when to change when you're uphill, because it's not always great on the, on the gear and on the components to shift while going uphill, but there are tactics around how to be able to do it. But you'll learn that as you start going through that, you learn where you're gonna hit, so you gear appropriately before you even hit the hill. Now there are a bunch of different ways to re around that. Someone's gonna be like, no, 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 Scott, that's not how you do it. This is how it should be. Everyone kind of has their own way. Everyone's still learning. I'm not a pro cyclist by any means, but I do enjoy being out and being within that community. They're such a great group. So if you have any further questions around those, talk to local groups that you have around. You can always reach out to myself as well for further information. But the best one is find someone within the community, friends, family, a club, something like that. You'll never regret going through those, getting onto a bike if it's been something you've wanted to do for a long time and really just enjoying the ride, enjoying the weather. It's supposed to be 31 today. That's why I'm showing this outside and not inside in the stuffy field house. This has been great. So how do we put this together now? We do a warm up. You get into your warm up. I don't care gear, nice and light. We're just riding. We're not doing anything crazy. Here's where you have that chance to then drop your gears. So drop into a small. I even add this into my warm up where you start to get that speed, right? 10 seconds, try and get minimal bounce. Right? We're nice and light on the handlebars, but we got some weight in the seat. We slow it down, okay? Do three or four of them. Give yourself 10 seconds, give yourself 20 seconds break. So kind of a reverse Tabata. So every 30 seconds, hit another 10 seconds, things like that. You can also then play with different gears. So every minute, I just gear up one. One more minute passes, I gear up one. Now I'm in my small ring here, so if you're on a spin bike, you're like gear, depending on whatever gear you start in. Um, with our spin bikes here, I'm at gear, it's been a while since COVID, gear five or six on our spin bikes. Now every spin bike's gonna be different. If you were a Kaiser, I started somewhere around 10, um, just cause they do have more gears, so I can start a little bit higher. And then every minute from there, I would just go up one for only five minutes. You don't want to get into a point where you're really like trying to crank on it and you're, you're grinding so hard. It's a warm up, remember, okay? So we ride through. 
we do our five minutes, whatever it might be. Then there's an interval day, let's say, that's what we're gonna work on. I'm gonna bump up into my big ring. So now we're up into that big ring. So we're feeling good with it. I'm gonna gear up just that little bit. So we're gonna do the exact same thing that we did with the high speed, so the high turnover, but now we're gonna do a maximal sprint, okay? Same thing, just 10 seconds, nothing crazy. So you're gonna have this hard interval day. We start to time, two, one, we do 10 seconds, and it's everything you got. And time. So you can slow yourself down. If you want to drop a couple gears, definitely go ahead. You can catch your breath. What's nice about being on a stationary bike, a lot of people like it in the winter time, is that you can get off your bike. Normally when you're riding, you can't stop. These are always good times that after you pedal for 10, 20 seconds, Sometimes your legs are feeling heavy, your quads are feeling heavy. Shake them out. Stand up. Make sure you always have water with you. Super important. Okay. So it's nice to be able to just stand up and shake stuff out. If you were on a group ride, the peeps that you're riding with are probably not going to appreciate it too much if you keep stopping. But you can definitely just slow your pace. So just nice and easy. 10 seconds on. Two minutes off, you can take even three minutes if you want. At most, ideally it'd be around two, just so you don't get the full, full, full recovery, because it is a very short amount of time. You can even do 90 seconds if you want. Depends how hard you want to tax that system. How many ripples, how many waves you want to create within the body, right? So we've done our intervals, okay? So we've done our warm up. We got straight into some intervals. Normally, I would then just do a 10 to 15 minute tempo ride. I would lower my tempo. I would do about 75 to 80%, okay, for 10 to 15 minutes. So you're kind of sitting at your lactate threshold or your anaerobic threshold. And what that means is that's the, that's the intensity that you can hold for 20 to 30 minutes. And we're working just below that. So we're not gonna hit that volitional fatigue you're gonna ride for 15 minutes and still feel okay. But in five more minutes after that, you can be like, oh, my body says I either gotta slow down or we gotta reduce the intensity in order for me to keep up with this. I can no longer keep up physically. My body's not producing enough energy. I'm not clearing enough of the carbon dioxide and waste product within the body. So we need to make an option. So you choose either slow down or I need to drop that intensity. So you're gonna ride at that 10 to 15 minutes. And that's just a straight up easy, ideally you don't wanna sit up, especially if you're on a bike like this. You always wanna be training within the position that you're gonna be in, right? So ideally we can either be on the tops or we can plop down and ride within our, our drops, but that's up to you. Whatever feels good, it's going to be dependent on your bike setup and what your preference of riding is, okay? So we would do a 10 to 15 minute window there. The other one we've done anywhere between five and eight sprints. So you're sitting at probably at least half hour, 40 minutes at this point if you've done like a 15 minute warm up, okay? So knowing that that's feeling good, you've done two drills, you already feel like you're like three quarters of the way done your, your routine for the day. So it can feel good when they're short, you always feel accomplished. Because each one you can cross off, it's something tangible to count. They're short enough that you can push through and feel good about it. Even though your body might not feel great, you know you're feeling good, right? So we ride through. After that endurance one, I would do another 10 to 15 minute. Um, I lie. We just did our endurance. Okay, now that we've done that, I would do slight intervals, so small, small intervals. So we did our 15 minute ride. 
Now we're gonna change pace a little bit. We would speed up just that little bit. Whether that means you change your gear harder and keep your same cadence, or you keep the same gear, but you start to pedal faster. So you can do either. You're gonna work within what cadence works for you. Again, majority of people say 70 to 80. I always teach 85 to 95, and I ride at 90 myself. That's what feels comfortable for me. That's where I feel the strongest and most powerful. So after our 10 to 15 minutes, we do another 10 to 15 minutes in three minute intervals. So we speed up for that three minutes. So we're just over our threshold now. Then we drop below it for three minutes, back to where we just were in the last 10 to 15 minute window. You speed up for the next three minutes that you're just over threshold again. So you're closer to 80, 85% of work. Drop down below and back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Then, one that I get asked a lot is why so long? But now you've done 55 minutes or so, 50, 55 minutes. Now you do your cool down. The cool down consists of 10 minutes of just nice, easy, slow riding. And all you're doing is you're just slowly bringing it down, slowly bringing it down, slowly bringing it down, slowly bringing it down. The reason we teach this, or I like to teach it this way, even though it's a lower intensity, if you think about the actual contract, 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 the second you jump off, if your heart rate has not recovered, you're getting a massive rush to the legs, which is where you get the lightheadedness, the nauseousness, the dizziness, and potential to pass out, okay? Then you're in the recovery position, all the stuff you don't wanna to have to deal with. Same thing about running. Most people stop their run, you know, two quick seconds, and they move on, but then they say they feel gross five minutes later. This is also gonna help clear out that lactic acid, right? So even though I'm feeling good right now, there's still waste product within my body. I wanna get that out the best I can. That's what's gonna drop my heart rate. That's what's gonna make me feel human again, okay? You breathe in through the nose, out through the mouth, calm your heart rate, 10 minutes. You can start to drop those gears. I usually do this in my small ring. It's super light. I'm not trying to impress here. I'm not trying to work harder. I'm not trying to add anything to my routine. I'm trying to physically start to slow down. Here's your chance for water. Bring your heart rate down. Just feel good once again, right? Cycling is such a good workout. It might be hard to see, but I'm sweating pretty good already. I've been on the bike for 15 minutes worth of light riding. I've done a couple quick intervals with everyone watching today and I'm sweating. You'd be surprised, but I feel great. Sometimes running feels 10 times harder if you're not a runner. I also enjoy running, but I find this a whole lot better. I like the scenery change. I like the clearing of the mindset. It's just kind of a head down, enjoy the open road and get to see, you know, your community, maybe another community that you've driven to, and a different light that you've never noticed it in a car. Usually as a driver, you don't get to see it. You're busy pointed at the road, you're worried about who's driving, who's on the sidewalks, things like that. You're not really watching your surroundings. This is your chance to really just see your city, see the same place that you live, maybe even within a couple blocks of where you live, in just a different light, okay? So now we've cooled down, we're feeling good. Let's talk about as a road cyclist, where to go. Most people, depending on you, again, like to start at a central location. So for myself, I drive from my place, I come up to work here at the base. It gives me a place to change, get ready, hub from, so it's easy for friends to get to, um, groups to get to, lots of parking, so you're not fighting parking around your home if you have a group coming with you or anything like that. You set up, there's nothing but back roads around here. There's a couple mains, which if you notice that the shoulders are wide enough and the shoulders are clean, go for it. As long as you feel comfortable being on a road that maybe a semi truck is gonna go past you, camper vans, bigger vehicles, if that's not your cup of tea, stay away from it. If you're just starting out on a road bike, just the neighborhood is fine. Go up and down where you know they're the quiet streets within your residential area. 
maybe you're on base in the queues, you have some places that you can ride around the area. It's usually quieter on weekends because everyone's at home. You find those kind of places. The other places you can go, if you have provincial parks that allow you to, the reason I super like provincial parks, they maintain their roads, right? You want something smooth. If it has a couple bumps, that's great. You're not gonna get away from it. But if you find that it's really rutted, really filled in, potholes, things like that, you'll find very quickly on a road bike, which has zero suspension, that it's not the funnest. Not to say you can't ride over it. Of course, the worst thing for a road bike is gravel, any kind of loose pebbles, things like that with a small thin tire. And again, a little bit of a sketch ride, unless you have what's called a cyclocross bike, which is a little bit of a wider one with a little bit of tread, which is meant for more of that off-road kind of racing. So those are great places to do it. If you have someone that's on an acreage, but it's paved around the area, so local small towns are great. Um, they're usually fairly well-maintained roads if they're not gravel. Um, if they are gravel, obviously not, but if they are paved roads, they're usually held up pretty well and they're usually quieter roads. If someone's gonna pass you, you've got lots of room. It's not a highway of, of traffic and trucks and everything like that. You make it the odd horse trailer or something like that flying past, but that's okay, right? Find those little places. Again, find the scenic places that's always gonna get you going. Find someone to ride with is always an amazing feeling, but don't feel that you have to. Um, for myself, the amount of stress relief and mental regeneration that I get from riding solo is phenomenal, okay? If you have a chance to get to mountain roads, things like that and take a trip, highly recommend it as well. But this is step one, right? Get on your bike, get training, get yourself rolling. Now, we've done our cool down. We always elicit stretches and they're the same as you would think they always are. Nothing changes. I like to do mine standing because usually after my ride, I'm pretty jiggly legged. So if I sit down, I know I'm gonna have a hard time getting back up. Not in a bad way, it's just the brain goes, oh, we're sitting, we're staying, right? So stretching hamstrings in whatever fashion you want, lying down, seated. I like to stand, sit back, stretch a hammy. Same thing with glutes. You can do the figure four stretch on the ground and lie back. Again, I like to stand, so I just cross and sit. You can get your quads, standing, sitting, lying. It doesn't matter. The other one that we tend to forget about is chest because you're in that forward roll. So either taking the hands behind you and pulling away or placing the hands on the low back and squeezing elbows together. That works as well. Some people will feel it in their traps. So don't forget to do a little bit of a neck stretch. Okay, that one's definitely gonna help you as well. Anything shoulders, if your forearms are feeling tight from grabbing too hard, don't forget to stretch those out. And the other one that everyone always tends to forget about because it's something that we don't think of is I'm always a big advocate of stretching the top of your foot. So stretching your tibialis anterior. And I know some people are cringing at me being like, you can't do that. It doesn't work. You shouldn't stretch that. Things like that. It's more of just an ankle mobility release in my eyes. Um, it's kind of how I follow it. And how that's achieved is you basically just cross one foot over the other and you're just kind of letting it stretch here. Okay. Some people like to go just behind them and stretch. Ideally, take your shoes off, do it barefoot because then you can curl your toes under and it just pulls a little bit more up on the top. Just feels really great. Um, for myself, that's very rigid in pulling my tib ants while I pedal. I'm not quite as relaxed as I could be. That's something that I always hit and I always feel that is important to me. So I hit it, but you hit you, you do you, right? Of course, when it comes to maintenance, you know your basic maintenance. If not, hit up a bike shop, let them do all the maintenance. So gear, um, calibrations, things like that. Don't mess with it as much unless you feel super confident with it because that's something that's just gonna end up costing you more later, right? And of course, just like a vehicle, the clicks, the weird bangs, the things, probably not the best idea. Get that checked out. Um, if you are in the market for bike trainers, great thing, watching Marketplace, watching Kijiji's, things like that. If you wanted to buy new, bike shops have tons of great information. You can do your own research on them as well. I highly recommend them come winter time because I do like to ride within the winter to still keep up my stamina and everything like that. Even though I do teach classes here on the base, it's a spin bike compared to my own bike. I'm getting used to my own bike. I like riding my own bike. So when I'm on something else, if I don't ride it all year and I get back onto it, yes, it is just like riding a bike. It will come back to you. But at the same time, you're feeling wobbly. You don't feel as confident as you were when the season ended the previous year. All right. Again, thank you all for watching. Again, my name is Scott Parody coming from CFP Edmonton. If you do have questions, comments, queries, reach out to your local PSP. They might be able to find out some information for you. Find those local cycling clubs, talk to them, pop into a cycling 
clothing store, talk to them as well. If not, you can also reach me. You can find me in the D1 and that way we can talk and converse. If you have any questions, comments, anything like that, enjoy your day. Hope everyone has a great one.